1945. War comes to Germany. The total war strikes back at the Germans in all its drama to reach its climax on German soil. 100 days of death and terror. There were moments, of course, before the Allies had crossed the Rhine. There were fears that the war could even go on into 1946. The Allies conquer the Third Reich. For many, these 100 days were simply a struggle for life or death. Survival or destruction. One can only imagine the horror of these final days. For Hitler, it was clear that he would kill himself. The only question was when. Hitler's end in the bunker, the downfall. The last hundred days were certainly the most terrible in the entire war for Germany and the German people. The Germans capitulate unconditionally. April 16th, 1945, still 22 days before war's end. The Zilu Heights, 60 kilometers east of Berlin, where 120,000 German soldiers have been entrenched since mid-April 1945. A million Red Army soldiers seek to drive them from their positions on April the 16th. A directive from the political administration states, no mercy, they have sown the wind now they will reap the storm. The offensive is led by Marshal Georgi Zukov. The Red Army was basically unclear about what resistance to expect on the other side and suffered terrible losses in the first few days, having misjudged the positions. As their shelling of the German lines missed the target, it was initially a disaster, and a great many Red Army men died in the storming of the Silo Heights. In other words, you could say that the Soviet army was characterized by a lack of consideration for its own men, again demonstrated by the attack on the Zilo Heights. The strategy of the front assault, we have more men and we don't care how many are killed. The Red Army virtually overruns the defenders' first positions, but a breakthrough only succeeds after four days. About 33,000 Soviet soldiers die in the battle. The commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht has ordered his soldiers to offer bitter resistance. It is Adolf Hitler's last order of the day. For the last time, the Jewish Bolshevik mortal enemy and his masses have come to attack. They are trying to destroy Germany and exterminate our people. At the same time, the Western Allies are mourning the loss of US President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who died on April 12th at the age of 63. The US newsreel shows pictures of the funeral. In April, a great man was dead. The loss of Franklin Delano Roosevelt was deeply felt by people all around the world. Hitler, on the other hand, rejoices in his last order of the day. The moment that fate removed the greatest war criminal of all time from this earth, the turn of this war was decided. The death of Roosevelt fueled hope for a miracle. The Prussians' second miracle. We know that the Tsarina died in the Seven Years' War and that Russia then dropped out of the coalition against Frederick the Great. Goebbels tries to produce a parallel. Now, with the death of Roosevelt, who drove the war with his plutocracy, the coalition of our enemies is falling apart. But propaganda minister Josef Goebbels is wrong in his assumption. Truman. Roosevelt's successor is sticking to the alliance with Stalin. On April 16, 1945, the Red Army launches its assault on Berlin on three fronts. The Americans besiege Leipzig and have conquered Hanover. The British are standing near Celle. 25 kilometers to the north is the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. 
about 75,000 prisoners, among them many forced laborers from Eastern Europe, have been crammed together for months, almost exclusively women and children. On this 16th of April, 1945, British reporters see the horror with their own eyes. A reporter writes, this day at Belsen was the most horrible in my entire life. The camp commandant is still detained on the premises. Most of the guards have fled. As a German woman writes to her husband, Oh, Fred, it's all so dreadful. I just can't understand how it came to this. Our dear, beautiful Germany. Is it true what they say we've done to the Jews? In purely rational terms, you knew what was happening. But it is a completely different matter to find the concentration camps with their tens of thousands of dead and actually see those camps and the human suffering. That was a real shock for the soldiers and the many cameramen who were there. They knew it cognitively. They knew that there would be such a thing. But to see it for themselves, experience it, the visual impressions, the smells, the sounds, to see this suffering led to a radicalization among the Allies. The Germans must be punished. They must be punished. On April 16, 1945, 22 days before the end of the war, an American camera team is filming in the liberated concentration camp of Buchenwald. The commanding US general orders that the populace be confronted with the extent of the atrocities. 1,000 inhabitants of the nearby city of Weimar are forced to visit the camp. The Germans didn't want to know. Sure, one could see the smoke from the crematoria. You could imagine that many people are sent there, but nobody, or hardly anyone, comes back. So something terrible must be going on. They just closed their eyes and looked away. I think the Americans already knew that, and that's exactly why they wanted to show them these terrible sights, to say, here, look, you looked away and now you no longer can. Now you have to look in order to understand what you are guilty of. The surviving prisoner recalls. Faced with the abominations which were offered to their eyes, the women screamed, some fainted, but the men too had to force themselves to keep their emotions in check. Horror and the first shame. Fred, I've completely lost my bearings. That would be madness, wouldn't it? And the horror stories about the SS, I don't know what's going on. I never thought that German men would dare to commit such atrocities. In the Rhineland, hundreds of thousands of German prisoners of war have to camp out in the open for lack of suitable billets, only poorly supplied. Thousands die of malnutrition and disease. The people who called themselves the master race, are on the brink of disaster. When will the world finally calm down about the war? It's almost impossible to imagine. If we do have to lose this war, I only hope it ends as soon as possible. April 23rd, 1945, still 15 days before war's end. Here in Nuremberg, the National Socialists have been celebrating their party rallies since 1929. On 20th April 1945, Hitler's 56th birthday, the city is liberated. Here too, most are glad that the war is over and wonder where things will go from here. Twenty-third April 1945, the British advance further towards Bremen and Hamburg. Leipzig and Magdeburg are in American hands. The Red Army has reached the outskirts of Berlin. For two days, the capital has been quaking under the barrage of Soviet artillery. 
the generals of the Red Army do not know how many defenders to expect. By telegram, Stalin urges Marshal Zhukov to hurry with a lie. Due to our slow advance, the Allies are advancing on Berlin and will soon have taken it. The attack on Berlin certainly did not go according to plan. I don't think that Zhukov had really thought through the next stage after uh, the breakthrough from uh, the Oderbruch. The real problem was that they uh, wanted to impress Stalin the fact that Berlin was already under fire, so artillery fire was opened up at extreme range. About 2.7 million people are still in the capital, awaiting the Red Army assault. Meanwhile, Berlin has been declared a frontline city with its own specially printed newspaper, the Panzerbeer. Combat paper for the defense of Greater Berlin calls for perseverance. A serious warning from the Führer. Remember, anyone who propagates or even approves measures that weaken our resistance is a traitor and is immediately to be shot or hanged. The mood in the Reich Chancellery is one of doom. At the previous day's situation meeting, Hitler was forced to realize that there is hardly anyone still able to carry out his orders. His inner circle of confidence is crumbling. Hitler also shies away from violence against certain people, from whom he senses a high degree of loyalty. When everyone again gathers on April 20th, Hitler's birthday, he could have insisted, and you're all to remain and we'll die together in the Reich Chancellery. But he does not. They all withdraw with flimsy excuses, the entire leadership, where it was certainly clear, what's the point? There's not anything left worth fighting for. Hitler has decided to remain in Berlin. No one is to be prevented from leaving the government center should they choose to do so. Hermann Goering withdraws to the Ober Salzburg. On April the 23rd, 1945, the Reich Marshal sends Hitler a telegram asking if he agrees to his, Goering's, assuming overall leadership of the Reich as his deputy, with full freedom of action, both internally and externally. Should he not receive an answer by 10 p.m., he must assume that Hitler is stripped of his freedom to act. Goering suffered for failing to do justice to Hitler. And this telegram he sends from Berchtesgaden to the capital of the Reich is likely a reaction to the news of Hitler's furious outburst, where he says, do whatever you want, the war is lost. No one in the Reich Chancellery has any idea of where things are going from here. And Goering must have believed that Hitler has somehow given up the reins, leaving the Reich without leadership. And at this moment, Goering is the man in charge. Not only has he been promoted as the state's second man, but as the second Führer. Hitler replies in anger. There can be no question of stripping my freedom to act. I therefore forbid any move in the direction you have indicated. The dictator accuses Goering of treason deposes him as commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe and has him arrested in Berchtesgaden. 23rd April 1945, 15 days before the surrender, Albert Speer again returns to the Führer's bunker beneath the Reichschancellery. As Minister of Armaments, Speer has been maintaining the fighting capability of the Wehrmacht month after month. Forced laborers and concentration camp prisoners are still slaving away in his factories under horrifying conditions. Speer will later write that Hitler was determined to die in Berlin. He has the feeling that he was speaking to a lifeless man. The dictator lets his friend and favorite architect depart unchecked. On the afternoon of April 23, 1945, Hitler has his last photograph taken in the ruins of the Reichschancellery. With him, adjutant Julius Schaub, one of his closest collaborators. Afterwards, 
the dictator entrenches himself in his underground bunker beneath four meters of concrete. Access is strictly controlled by the SS. Propaganda minister Josef Goebbels is here in hiding and continues broadcasting slogans of perseverance on the radio. Meine Berliner Volksgenossen und Volksgenossinnen, in heldenhafter Abwehr haben unsere tapferen Divisionen und Volkssturmmänner in den vergangenen Tagen den Sowjets schwerste Verluste zugefügt. Ihr aufopferungsvoller Einsatz hat jedoch nicht verhindern können, dass die Bolschewisten an die äußeren Verteidigungslinien der Reichshauptstadt herangekommen sind. Damit ist Berlin zur Frontstadt geworden. Verteidiger Berlins, ihr kennt jetzt eure Aufgabe. Und ich weiß, ihr werdet sie vorbildlich erfüllen. Die Stunde eurer Bewährung ist da. Ich bleibe mit meinen Mitarbeitern selbstverständlich in Berlin. Auch meine Frau und meine Kinder sind hier und bleiben hier. Mit allen Mitteln werde ich die Verteidigung der Reichshauptstadt aktivieren. Magda Goebbels has moved into the bunker with her six children. Harold, her son from her first marriage, is a British prisoner of war. Goebbels' wife has made numerous films of herself and the children for her husband's birthday. One takes place in an air raid shelter. They intentionally brought their children with them into the bunker. And at that moment, it was certain that they would die there, since there was no escaping such a situation. She would still have had the chance to refuse, send her children away. There were still all kinds of possibilities, take the children out of the city, park them with relatives. And it was a decision, a very conscious decision, to say, no, we won't do that, we will go and die with our Führer. Only at the Berghof does Hitler take some time out for private affairs. It's his second government headquarters at Berchtesgaden, where countless official documents are kept. But also the correspondence with his mistress, Eva Braun. According to the dictator's will, everything is to be destroyed by his adjutant. So Julius Schaub is dispatched to destroy Hitler's private correspondence in Berlin and over Salzburg, since the Führer was not permitted to have any close personal ties. And in the final days, the Reich Security Service responsible for the protection of Hitler and Eva Braun in Ober Salzburg destroyed all private letters and Eva Braun's remaining possessions. Everything, in fact, that indicated the presence of a woman. Miraculously, the film shot in Ober Salzburg by Eva Braun and her sister escaped destruction. After the end of the war, they are discovered in Austria by an SS man. April 25th, 1945, still 13 days before war's end. Hitler loves the seclusion of the mountains. In the early morning of April 25th, 1945, the so-called Führer Sperrgebiet, the Führer's restricted area, receives some uninvited guests. The false security of Berchtesgaden, from where so much of the world's tragedy was planned and directed, was shattered in April by a force of allied heavy bombers. Arriving at daybreak, they attack Hitler's notorious mountain hideout and the chalet in the valley below with 12,000 pound bombs fused for deep penetration. British bombs reduce the area to ash and rubble, thus preventing the Berghof from serving as a last retreat. 25th April, 1945. Landsberg on the Lech. A local artist secretly takes photographs as concentration camp prisoners are driven from the city. Rare documentation of these days of commonplace horror. The SS begins. The SS begins clearing the concentration camps and satellite camps, hoping to conceal the evidence of their crimes. And they're trying to take those still reasonably fit for transport, those who are already starved and emaciated from forced labor, malnutrition and disease, and ship them to the West. Again and again, the Allies stumble upon victims of the so-called death marches, 
concentration camp prisoners who starved, froze to death, or were shot on their wanderings through Germany. US troops discovered this train near Munich at the end of April 1945. Twenty fifth April, nineteen forty five, the ring around Berlin is closed. The Red Army fights its way into the city center in house to house combat. The Americans stand outside Regensburg and at Torgau on the Elbe. For a long time, the district town of Wurzen near Leipzig lay exactly between the fronts. On this twenty fifth April, nineteen forty five, the town is in American hands. The day before, the mayor surrendered Wurzen without a fight. Unwilling to fall into the hands of the Red Army, soldiers of the Wehrmacht and the men of the Volkssturm prefer to go into American captivity. At the railway station, the supply depots are plundered by some inhabitants of Wurzen and liberated foreign workers. The small town of Lorenzkirch on the Elbe is the scene of an historic event on this 25th April 1945. An American reconnaissance team is crossing. Many refugees have died here over the last few days. Hardly a suitable spot for a first encounter with the Soviet allies. Only this snapshot of a Red Army soldier has survived. The next day, 40 kilometers downstream on the Elbe Bridge in Torgau, the first official meeting between the Soviets and the Americans has been specially organized for the cameras. Both sides prepare a big celebration. The photos and film footage will go around the world. The performance in Torgau was for the people of the world to show the two major powers that had waged this war, shaking hands and uniting. That was a very important production. I think it was of more importance for the Americans than for the Soviet Union, which had wanted to be the sole victor. But for the Western world, this handshake and this production had great significance, because it symbolized the end of the war. East meets West is the name given to the spectacle that takes place in Torgau on the 27th April 1945. The Allies, too, are allowed to be present. Nothing is left to chance. Photographers and camera teams have been specially brought in to document the British, Americans and Soviets demonstrate unity. The alliance against Hitler is nearing its goal. April 28, 1945. Still 10 days before war's end. The high banks of the Elbe, southeast of Hamburg. According to the will of SS chief Heinrich Himmler, every town and village is to be defended at all cost. German units have hidden in the woods, although they lack heavy weapons. The troops, men of the Volkssturm and the Hitler Youth, only managed to hold off Britain's Operation Enterprise for a single day. The idea was uh, that the British were going to protect, if you like, the northern flank of the Americans. It was also a way of pushing Montgomery out of any glory seeking of heading for Berlin. Montgomery was again very, very slow in many of these operations. So uh, both at Bremen um, and then particularly uh, the amount of time that he waited just before pushing on into Hamburg uh, certainly exasperated the supreme commander. Britain's entire strategy was to minimize losses, use firepower and evade potential defensive positions. The British were gradually running out of troops and feared the consequences of this war and Britain's comparatively high casualties. And that was the clear command to the British generals. No further losses, the fewest possible casualties, and quickly put an end to the war. By 28th April 1945, Bremen is in British hands. Montgomery has been unable to prevent bloody house-to-house -house combat. In Berlin, Soviet units have occupied the city center. Hitler's last contingent is entrenched in the burning capital. Snipers of the Waffen-SS target Red Army soldiers from the rooftops. Wehrmacht soldiers and adolescent Hitler youths try to halt the superior force with machine guns and the German bazookas called Panzerfaust. As soon as they had actually joined up on the west side of the city, 
the attack into the city began. And um, the tactics were not clever at all, uh, because the um, tanks we charged in, first of all, trundling down uh, the centre of the street, uh, found themselves under uh, fairly easy targets for the uh, Volkssturm and SS uh, detachments with uh, Panzerfaust. They then tried other uh, tactics. They had uh, infantry on top of the tanks, firing at every single window in every direction. But then the tanks couldn't really traverse their turrets. And finally, they had this thing whereby they had sort of one tank on either side of the street, sort of crossing and shooting diagonally. But actually, their most effective weapons were the heavy howitzers, the 203 millimeters and 152 millimeter howitzers, uh, which they just used to blast every single barrier, every single house, if necessary, in their way. From secret intelligence reports, the Soviets know that Hitler is in Berlin, and it is also clear that the capital will be taken by the Red Army. The government district is under continuous fire. In the bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery, the commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht finally realizes that no help will be coming from outside. Hitler finally realizes openly, though I'm sure at times before that he must have known in his heart, but he admitted openly after he realized that there was going to be no counterattack. He knew that that was really was the end. He expresses that by basically saying that he had to put an end to himself. And we know that uh, Hitler's great fear, of course, was being taken back to Moscow in a cage or even having his body exhibited in Moscow, which was one of the reasons why he insisted on having his body burnt. South of the Alps on the 28th of April, 1945, 10 days before the end of the war, Hitler's closest ally, Italy's dictator Benito Mussolini, is arrested and executed by partisans. The following day, eager onlookers gather in Milan to see the bodies of El Duce and his mistress, Clara Petacci. For days, Heinrich Himmler has been negotiating with the Swedish diplomat who is sounding out a surrender on the Western Front. In return, the SS leader promises the release of concentration camp prisoners. On the evening of April 28, 1945, Swedish radio reports on the negotiations. Hitler is furious. The fact that Himmler is negotiating a possible surrender is a heavy blow for Hitler, as Himmler has always presented himself differently and structured the entire SS order differently. And tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, have died for Himmler in the belief that there's only battle, victory or destruction. That's what Himmler always said. But now at the last moment, he sees things somewhat differently. And this, of course, is a real betrayal, and for Hitler, possibly the most serious betrayal of all. The fall of the faithful Heinrich has consequences for one of his closest colleagues, SS Section Commander Hermann Fiegelein. Himmler's representative at the Führer's headquarters. Arrested the previous day for leaving the Reich Chancellery without permission on Hitler's orders, Fiegelein is summarily shot. Now, when the Reich is in its final death throes, the hunt for traitors begins. Who stands with us and who is a turncoat? Who is possibly trying to flee? And thus, Decisions are made, like that of executing Hermann Fegelein. These are the last gasps of an inner circle, still hunting for traitors as it goes down in flames. Eva Brown refuses to intervene on behalf of Fegelein, her own sister's husband. To her, only loyalty to Hitler matters. Shortly after the war ends, his secretary, Traudel Junger, tells US investigators of the final days in the bunker. Eva Braun has followed her lover to Berlin in order to die with him. Eva Braun declared in the afternoon that we certainly will have to shed tears this evening. Our question whether Hitler intended to commit suicide tonight was answered with a no. There was to be another reason. 
Hitler war unglaublich dankbar, dass Hitler was incredibly grateful that Eva Braun actually joined him in the bunker in those final weeks. Time and again he offered her the chance to leave, truly wanting her to live on. But she insisted on staying. Also auch eine tiefe Dankbarkeit. So in deep gratitude to this woman, who'd always proved to be loyal and faithful, he married her. Deswegen heiratet er sie auch. Shortly before midnight, Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun stand before a registrar. Josef Goebbels and Martin Bormann are witnesses to the marriage. Now, you can call me Frau Hitler, the bride supposedly said afterwards. The original marriage certificate. The bride almost signs it as Eva Braun, but she notices her mistake in time. April 30th, 1945, still eight days before war's end. Tsiko, near the Elbe. On April 30th, 1945, the village is right between the fronts. The Red Army is approaching from the east, while US troops are shelling from the west. Fanatical SS troops kill anyone daring to raise the white flag. In panic, the residents try to extinguish the flames. Tsiko finally capitulates. The scene is reenacted for a US camera crew. Most of the Wehrmacht soldiers and Volkssturm men would have surrendered earlier, but staunch Nazis kept them in check for days. They were to fight until their dying breath. Then most of the Gauleiters made stirring speeches before trying to flee the scene and somehow survive. And there are just a few, but they exist, who apply this Nazi ideology to themselves on a one-to-one -one basis. The victim plays a major role in Nazi ideology. The victim for the sake of sacrifice. As an officer writes in his journal, You can't surrender at the last minute and then for the rest of your life regret that you didn't hold out. 30th April, 1945, eight days before the end of the war, the Wehrmacht capitulates in Italy. Munich has surrendered without a fight. In Berlin, the Red Army continues its advance. Fighting still continues in a few streets in Berlin's inner city, and the defenders are running out of ammunition. The military reckon they can hold out for two days at most. Red Army troops besiege the Reichstag, where SS units have barricaded themselves in. In the Reichschancellery, Hitler's downfall is imminent. The dictator has commissioned Martin Bormann to organize his and Eva Hitler's suicide, as well as the burning of their bodies. Hitler's personal secretary is unconditionally loyal. At the end of the 80s, a GDR camera team films the bunker of the Reichschancellery before it is sealed off forever. On the 30th of April, 1945, the dictator and his wife bid farewell to their last companions. Hitler gave me his hand and said, Frau Junge, now it is so far, it is finished. Goodbye. He talked with a weak voice. Eva Braun embraced me and said, give my greetings to Munich and take my fur coat as a memory. She disappeared with Hitler in his little working room and the door was closed. It's 3.15 p.m. Nobody hears when the shot is fired. It was certainly a bit of a production, yet nobody knows exactly what happened. Ultimately, there were only two people in the room, namely Eva and Adolf Hitler. It is now thought that Adolf Hitler shot himself and that Eva Hitler died by poison. In any event, it is clear that both Adolf and Eva Hitler committed suicide in rapid succession. The day before, the Führer dictated his last will and testament to his secretary. In his private will, he justifies his suicide as follows. I and my wife choose death to escape the shame of deposition or surrender. His political testament has also been preserved. 
Das Testament von Hitler ist dann nochmal. Hitler's will is once again his legacy, a legacy to posterity. At its heart is the expression of his work, the justification that he wanted the best, that he wanted to lead Germany into a great future and was obviously unworthy of the German people. Ich würde quasi. In the streets, his subjects must plunder in order to survive. Hundreds of soldiers die in the final days of the war. Yet their commander in chief has long since laid responsibility aside. Hitler has appointed Grand Admiral Dönitz as president of the Reich and supreme commander of the Wehrmacht. What is interesting, for example, is that there is no leader as successor. The Führer is the union of the office of Reich President with the office of Reich Chancellor. That no longer exists, yet after Hitler's death, Goering is no longer an option. Since he has allegedly committed treason, the office is divided. There is a new Reich President, Dönitz, and a new Reich Chancellor, Goebbels. The stronger is Dönitz, a military man and no politician. Martin Bormann informs Dönitz about the succession arrangements, but not about Hitler's death. In a telegram, the Grand Admiral innocently pledges, I will bring this war to an end, as the heroic struggle of the German people demands. Dönitz, is a man der Dönitz was absolutely loyal to Hitler. And as long as Hitler was alive, or he believed Hitler to be alive, Dönitz did not deviate one millimeter from his usual course. Namely, to do what he considered necessary as a military man on the one hand, and faithfully do as Hitler intended on the other. For Hitler, Dönitz was prepared to go to extremes. Dönitz has set up his headquarters in Holstein, Switzerland, in a barracks near Plön. There, the Grand Admiral rallies his followers and takes precautions, just in case. On April 30th, 1945, he summons Heinrich Himmler by radio. The SS leader is surprised, having met with Dönitz only that morning. To his bodyguard, he says, there must be something going on. Please take enough people with you. The moment when we see Himmler going to see Dönitz and obviously wanting to demand a senior position in the new regime, it's hardly surprising that Dönitz, having been warned by Bormann that uh, he is now a traitor uh, and must be arrested at the first opportunity and so forth, um, doesn't quite know how to handle things and uh, doesn't know whether Himmler might have some of his SS uh, coming from outside ready to stage a coup there in the north. Although both are staunch national socialists and anti-Semites, Dönitz despises the party elite. As a precaution, he has a loaded pistol within reach. Let me be the second man in your state, the SS chief is alleged to have said. Dönitz refuses. He has no use for him. Himmler leaves without further ado. May 1st, 1945, still seven days before war's end. Dachau concentration camp near Munich for 12 years, a place of torment, torture, and murder. May 1st, 1945, Hollywood director George Stevens is in Dachau with the camera team to document conditions in the camp. Two days earlier, US troops liberated 32,000 prisoners. They also find several thousand victims who did not survive the SS death marches. The forced laborers under Speer's regime were all left to die. I mean, in fact, they were um, starved. The guards, of course, abandoned them um, because they knew perfectly well what sort of retribution was awaiting them. And in fact, there were also organized massacres of them in times by SS groups and so forth, uh, because they were still terrified of this idea of an uprising by the forced laborers. Reacting with unbridled rage, some of the GIs shoot about 50 security guards, but most perpetrators are apprehended as a matter of course. 
SS men, disguised as prisoners, are unmasked by camp inmates. In Berlin, the Red Army is celebrating. The defenders in the government quarter have not yet capitulated, as Stalin had actually hoped would happen for the International Day of Labor. There are rumors of Hitler's death, but no confirmation. Reich Chancellor Goebbels has offered a truce to the Soviet generals, but they decline. Instead, as a symbol of victory, the red flag is waving on the burnt-out Reichstag, just as Stalin ordered. When the Red Army took Berlin, there were only a few representative buildings left standing. The Reich Chancellery was a wreck. Most of the other buildings had no significance. Only the building of the Reichstag was known to some members of the international public. You can't fly a flag on a building that nobody knows. So there was a visible symbol that could be displayed. And that, one shouldn't forget, was also a message for the Germans. The flag is hanging on the Reichstag. Close by, beneath the Reich Chancellery, Goebbels knows that the Soviets can arrive at any moment. He first shoots his wife, Magda, and then himself. The bodies are burned. Prior to that, the couple poisoned their six children. A few days later, their bodies are lined up for a Soviet camera. Exactly who crushed the poison capsules into the mouths of the sleeping children is unclear to this day. Most likely, it was their own mother. This is really difficult to understand, to kill one's own children as a mother. It's hard to understand and it shows just how fanatical people were back then and what they were capable of. After all, there were some lesser known cases of mothers killing their children. For example, so they wouldn't be raped by the Soviets. For example, because they feared that the barbarians would invade the country. May 1st, 1945, seven days before surrender. There is still fighting in the capital. At 9.40 p.m., the radio announces the death of Adolf Hitler. It is reported from the Führer's headquarters that this afternoon, in his command post in the Reich Chancellery, our Führer Adolf Hitler fell for Germany, fighting Bolshevism to his dying breath. A lie. On 2nd May, the capital surrenders. A Berlin woman writes in her diary. Hitler is dead and we act like it's none of our business. Events engulfed him. Like a phantom, the Third Reich has dissolved. With the swastikas of his Nazi flags, Herr Hitler has also been dumped on the rubbish heap. May 6th, 1945, still two days before war's end. The Czech city of Pilsen was occupied by the Nazis for six years. Even now, the Germans are still trying to suppress uprisings. On 6th May 1945, the war is over in Pilsen. Welcoming cheers greet the US troops. The German city commander surrendered at 2.15 p.m. and then he and his wife took their own lives. Again and again, the liberators encounter victims of reprisals. The annexation of the Sudetenland in 1938 and the crimes of the German occupiers are not forgotten. In several parts of Eastern Europe, there are acts of violence against German military personnel, but also against German civilians. On the one hand, there are naturally feelings of rage against the occupiers who have oppressed the country for years, which led to high casualties among the civilian population. And on the other, we know that some of these violent outbreaks were politically motivated. 
The idea was to spread so much fear and terror among the German-speaking population that they would voluntarily leave the territory and then say, OK, coexistence is no longer possible. Tens of thousands of Germans have been evacuated or are fleeing their homeland. In camps on the other side of the Czech border, Wehrmacht soldiers are taking refuge from the Red Army. For civilians too, there are only makeshift collective camps. Sixth May, 1945. There is still fighting in Prague. The Wehrmacht has capitulated in the south, in the Netherlands and in Denmark. Only a few areas are still controlled by the Reich government. In the far north of Germany, in flensburg murwick the incumbent Reich government holds spectral cabinet meetings in a naval school. Among Dönitz's closest advisers are Colonel General Alfred Jodl and Albert Speer. Here, pictures after the arrest at the end of May 1945. The president of the Reich categorically rejects capitulation on the Eastern Front. The Wehrmacht is only to lay down its arms in the West and the North. Dönitz was in control of uh, a shrinking territory from somewhere to the north of Berlin to Flensburg. Um, he appointed a few technocrats to run this administration and to some extent they were successful in ensuring food supplies for the civilian population. Uh, he gave instructions for the troops in the west to surrender to the advancing allies, but in the east the, the fight was to continue. Near Tangumunda, on the river Elbe, entire Wehrmacht units seek refuge in American captivity. A German woman writes in her diary. What will become of us and our children in our poor, devastated fatherland? The guilt that the leadership, and with it the German people, visited upon themselves through all the unspeakable cruelties in the concentration camps has found swift atonement. Hermann Goering is taken into custody by the US Army. War is like a soccer game, he apparently said. In the end, the loser shakes hands with the winner and all is forgotten. The Americans see it differently. As a major war criminal, he is sentenced to death in 1946, but commits suicide before his execution. 6th May. 1945, Colonel General Alfred Jodl flies to the headquarters of the Western Allies in Reims. He still hopes for a separate armistice, but the British and Americans demand unconditional surrender on all fronts. When the negotiations and the so-called final surrender was made in Reims, the American high command felt that we had to involve the Soviets in some way, so they called in General Suslaparov, who was the Soviet representative at uh, Schaeff headquarters, to be one of the signatories. Um, because as far as they were concerned, you know, that was the end of the war, as the uh, Germans in the West were prepared to surrender. Yodel eventually signs. The war is to end on 8th May at 11 p.m. Central European time. At the entrance to the Reich Chancellery, Soviet soldiers rejoice over an alleged catch. They claim to have discovered Hitler's body, but it turns out to be only a soldier who resembles Hitler. By May 6th, the bodies of Adolf and Eva Hitler have already vanished from the garden of the Reich Chancellery. The Soviet Secret Service has informed Stalin, but he keeps the news to himself. That was a power tactic typical of Stalin. You don't share information, you keep your allies in the dark. They should be unsure about what could still happen, some werewolf groups, Hitler still sitting somewhere, issuing secret commands. That was Stalin's interest here. He alone had the information. Why pass it on? May 8, 1945. The Second World War in Europe is at an end. In Flensburg, 
there is still fear of a coup d'etat by Heinrich Himmler. In a personal conversation, Dönitz has meanwhile stripped the SS chief of all offices. But nothing happens, and so, on 8th May 1945, the President of the Reich announces the end of the war on the radio. German men and women, in my speech on May the 1st, in which I informed the German people of the death of the Führer and my appointment as his successor, I described it as my first task to save the lives of German people. In order to achieve this goal, in the night of May 6th to the 7th, I gave the High Command of the Wehrmacht the order to declare the unconditional surrender of all fighting forces on all battlefields. On May the 8th, 11 p.m., the guns will fall silent. 8th May, 1945, the last day of the Second World War in Europe. A US cameraman films GIs on Himmler's estate at the Bavarian Lake Tegensee. The SS chief has vanished without a trace. On 20th May, he is arrested by British investigators and three days later commits suicide with a cyanide pill. When Stalin learns of the surrender in the West, he is furious and demands a reprise of the ceremony in his own sphere of influence. Thus, on 8th May 1945, a delegation of the Wehrmacht travels to Berlin Karlshorst. It was unthinkable for a Soviet newsreel to show the signing of the surrender in Reims, chaired by an American general. After four years of continuous propaganda, portraying the Soviet Union as the sole victor in the Second World War, they couldn't then show a surrender in Reims with a Russian general sitting at the side of the table. That would have been inconceivable. And because it was inconceivable, the surrender had to be reconstructed in Karlshorst and Soviet-occupied Berlin, with Zukov presiding. And that was the major production. Now, in the Soviet Union, they could show that the Soviet Union was, in fact, the real victor of the war, with the French, British and Americans sitting on the sidelines, with the Soviet general in the center. And that gave the impression that the others were merely assessors, and that they were also assessors in the war. That was decisive. After 2,077 days, on 8th May 1945, the Second World War comes to an end in Europe. For millions, the last hundred days had been a struggle for life and death. A hundred days of death and terror. The collapse of a world gone mad the liberation from indescribable suffering, the end of privation and fanaticism, and the dawning of a new age. <laughs>